Rebellion equals freedom. We didn't actually know how to say it like that, but that's the idea in which we kind of operated from over the, since we were about 12 or 13 years old or so. It just made sense, right? Rebellion equals freedom. The best way to get free is to rebel against the rules or ignore the rules. Because as long as I was keeping the rules, I wasn't truly free. And as we grow up, that kind of changes into some more sophisticated version of the same thing. And as adults, we know it doesn't really work as we can see prisons full of people who are not following the rules and have lost their freedom. If I disagree with a rule, I'll ignore it or I won't follow it. I'm still going to be free and I'm still going to do what I want to do, but instead of dismissing all authority, I'm just taking it one at a time and one law at a time and figure out which ones I like and which ones I don't. Back in my, my first year of, of teaching, I was in a, a big exam hall, probably the size of this room here, and there was probably 100 students or so, and um, there's a few teachers of, of us in there, and we were all kind of watching for a couple hours or so as these students write their exams, and there's not much to do, but so I kind of let my eyes wander around because you have hours and upon hours, and so I, I caught a glimpse of this one guy um, who I didn't teach, but he, just, he was just doing some weird behavior. And so I watched him a little bit more over the next hour or so, and he was doing something uh, very, very slyly. He, he was, now this is Canada, so it's cold, so he was wearing a sweater, a long sleeve or a jumper, if you may, I don't know, jumper, sweater. Um, so he he would have the, the sweater all the way down to his wrist, and once in a while he would kind of lift it up very slowly and just kind of like glance down and then write some more. A few more minutes would, would pass by, he'd kind of slowly lift up his sleeve again, glance down, write some more, and I'm like, what is this guy up to? I was, I was too far away to really like hone in and see what he was doing. <clears throat> but I'm like, he's up to something. So the end of the hour comes up, and um, I kind of tell another teacher, I'm like, I, I don't know what this guy's doing. He, he's doing something. And uh, <clears throat> we go over to him, and, and I'm like, how was the exam? He's like, oh, it was great. You know, okay, okay good. Um, what, what, what's on your arm? What do you mean, what's on my arm? Nothing. I have, I have a sweater on. I have, there's nothing on my arm. No, what, what, what's, what's underneath your sleeve? He's like, Nothing. Can I see it? Can I see your arm? Which you thought was kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird, weird request if you don't have any proof of anything. But so I'm like, can I just see what's written on your arm? And at this point he's kind of like, he know he's, he know he's busted at this point. There's another teacher there. So he, he rolls up his sleeve and written on his forearm were formula after formula after formula. And he was getting his, his math paper done and he's got formulas written. I'm like, what are those? And he's like, you know what, it, it didn't hurt anybody, it's just how I study. I'm like, this is how you study. You write on your forearm and you study on your forearm. I don't believe you. He's like, this is how I study. And so I did this all yesterday and I was studying like this all yesterday. And I, it got to the point where he was definitely caught. But the fact that he was saying, it's not hurting anybody, I kind of remember that to this day. And um, another story, and I'm sure many of you have had this similar experience of, of speeding in our city or speeding in another city. And um, I definitely have had my fair share of these incidences. Uh, but, and I'm sure many of you, I know some of you have. I know in my own family, I'm not the heaviest foot. But um, not naming any names at all. <laughs> but we get to a point where things are clear and we just want to go. We just want to go. There's no one else around. We just want to take that speedometer down past where it should be and just fly. And many times we do that and there's a cop hiding right behind a tree or somewhere and they catch us. And it's like, you know what? There's no one else around. I wasn't hurting anybody. I wasn't doing anything really wrong, was I? I was just kind of going over your suggested speed limit. But we've all done that. We've all evaluated things rule by rule. And in your business or in your workplace, 
maybe you see things or maybe, you, maybe you, there's times when you say, oh, I, I should be allowed to do this. I should be allowed to, you know, God would understand if I, if I do this in my business. He would get it. He would understand. I'm not doing anything anyone really wrong. The government has tons of money. I'm just doing my little part. I don't think God would really care that much. You know, there's different, there's different situations where this happens. Many examples of where we just, because we don't agree with it, maybe we dis- disregard it or ignore it. Now, I'm like you. I'm, I'm kind of for authority, especially when I'm in the authority. Um, I think authority is a great idea. I think people should respond positively to authority, should submit to, sub- to authority. Uh, and I think it's great when authority supports my decisions, right? And in Romans 13, you may be wondering where I'm going with this, but we're going to Romans 13 today, and we're in the midst of a series of the sovereignty of God. And we've talked about suffering, we've talked about creation, and how God is sovereign over those. And today we're going how God is sovereign over authority today. And in Romans 13, we want to look at the first seven verses of Romans 13. And... It's kind of a difficult part of Scripture. It's easy to understand, but it's really, really hard practically to put it into place. There's a lot of difficulties with handling some of these verses. But what gives these verses credibility is not only the fact that they're in the Bible, but the context in which they're written. Because Romans is a letter, and it was written to Christians who lived in Rome. And if you know anything about this time, there weren't many Christians in Rome in the first century. It wasn't a good place if you were a Christian. The emperor during this time, you may have heard of the emperor Nero. Um, If you don't know much about him, he was a pretty, pretty wicked guy. He burnt the city of Rome. He blamed it on the Christians. Um, He would burn Christians at the stake. He would light them up and have his garden parties uh, with them. He would feed he would feed Christians to the lions. Christianity didn't fare very well under Nero. He was a pretty terrible emperor. He killed part of his own family. He was kind of a loose cannon. He was kind of crazy. But he's in charge of the government when Paul is writing these verses. So keep that in mind when we read these verses that this is Paul living under the authority of Nero, who was a pretty wicked guy, did not support Christianity in any way. And Paul writes this, verses 1 to 7. It says, let everyone... Be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear from fear of the one in authority, then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them, what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So the first point that I want to make today is is in verse 1 and 2. Every government is put in place by God. Every government is put in place by God. By God, And it's not about what rules to follow or not, but it's who you are supposed to submit to, and this is God. So I was thinking, is the basic premise, is the basic idea of this not right? Are all governing authorities really instituted by God? Is all authority from God? Or are just governments instituted by God? And when we look at the second verse, because he knew we would continue on and look at the second verse, it says... The authorities that exist have been established by God. Now, it must mean religious authority, right? Maybe like the rabbi or the priest or the pope 
or the preacher, but it doesn't. It doesn't even go in that direction. It says, no, all authorities have been established by God. And he points us to a principle that we're going to find throughout the scriptures again and again. If we, and if we pause long enough to let it sink in, it's such a powerful concept that it will make sense out of so much of life and even out of history as well. Here's what the Bible teaches, that God always works through human authority. Good human authority or bad human authority, he's working through human authority. Now the evidence of this outside of Paul's writing um, here in, in Romans, we can find in, in, in various places, but we can also find it in Daniel and John. Even though Daniel describes the deeds of very evil kings in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 21, he says it is God who removes kings and sets up kings. Later on, a couple chapters later, in, in chapter 4, verse 32 in Daniel, he says the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. So according to Daniel, even wicked kings should acknowledge that they have their position and authority only from God. The same thing is taught in, John, in the Gospel of John. Pilate, who's, by whose authority Jesus was finally crucified for your sins, for my sins, so we can have eternal life with him, was the governing authority set and ordained by God. If we look at John 19, verse 10, Pilate says to Jesus, I like this little interaction here, he says, do you not know that I have the authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answers right back. He says, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. No authority unless it had been given from above. I'm not sure his reaction after that, but he'd probably be like, wow, that was a good comeback. Um, so therefore, if, if leaders in the Bible, like Pilate, Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, were set in their places and given authority by God, even though they did much evil, and we'll get to more of that later, later on, then we have no reason to deny that, you know, Paul's statement, there is no authority except from God in Romans 13.1. So Paul says, look, it's not about the what, the what rules and what rule that we do or do not like. It's about who, because God exercises his will and his authority through the human authorities that he has allowed us and he has established. To which we go, okay, that's good. That's kind of scary, actually, if you think about that. If God has established them, all authority, that means if I disobey my parents, if I rebel at school, if I do something my company has asked me not to do, or I don't do things right within the government, then the implication of that is to kind of rebel and disregard those rules. It's kind of like disregarding or rebelling against God. And verse 2 says, Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. And so God says to you and I, here's kind of the, the overarching idea or principle. That your attitude and your response to human authorities is a reflection of your attitude and response to your Father in heaven. Andy Stanley, is, I like Andy Stanley, he gives a quote uh, in regards to this. He says that your response to the authorities you can see is a reflection of your response to the, the authority, the authority, that you cannot see. And to think that somehow we can be out from underneath the authorities God has put over us, and at the same time be under God's authority, is a confused notion. You can't be out from underneath the human authorities he's established and under God's authority at the same time. That was a great quote. You can't be out from under human authorities and be under God's at the same time. It just doesn't go, it just doesn't go together since God has set up all authority. The second point I'd like to, to go on to is, to, is found in, in verse 3 and 4. <clears throat> it says, we should honor and submit to those who govern us because that is submission. And I know submission is not a very popular word. Um, the idea that comes with submission but if, all, if we look also in 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter 2, 
goes well with these verses as well. 1 Peter 2, verses 13 and 14, it says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. So reasons for submission. Why should we submit according to what Paul is saying us, to us today? Well, first reason what is, if we see it in, in verse 4, he is God's servant. The civil authority is God's servant. And, and later on in verse 6, the authorities are ministers of God. So the first reason for submission is that all authority, again, is instituted by God who governs all things. And so therefore, civil authorities are God's servants and ministers. The second reason for submission to authority is that they're, they're, they are there for our good. It is good for us that there is government rather than chaos and anarchy. In verse 4, for he is God's servant for your good. It's for your good that there is civil authority rather than everyone doing what is right in his or her own eyes. If you can imagine absolute chaos and anarchy where there's everything is doing whatever is right in someone else's own eyes even a bad government would be better than that alternative <clears throat> the third reason for submission is that the civil authorities bear the sword or the gun and if you don't submit they'll punish you in verse 4 it says but if you do wrong be afraid for he does not bear the sword in vain for he is the servant of God an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And the fourth reason for submission is that beneath and above civil authority is a greater kind of reality, the law, you know, the moral law of God expressed, um, you know, in, in right, doing things right and doing things that are wrong. So if you go against the authority, you're kind of going against the moral law of God. And Paul assumes that if you do right things, you'll be submitting to the government and they will be rewarding you. And if you do wrong things, then you are not submitting to the government and they will be, and then therefore you'll be punished. You see this in verses three and four. And so, <clears throat> if you're, if we look at verses three and four, if we look at this, this section here, if you're a government official, if you're a company president, uh, you own your own company, you're an education, you're a teacher, you're a principal, um, you're God's servant. But if you do wrong, we, we need to be a, a little bit afraid of that as well. We're God's servant. And so, we're your boss, whoever that is, he's God's servant. He's God's servant. He's God's agent. He's God's agent in your life. Your boss, the one who doesn't even believe in God, one who doesn't care about God, that doesn't bother God at all. God's going to work through that, through that human authority, period. It has nothing to do with religion, because he's writing, Paul's writing to this to Christians living in Rome under Nero. But, but here's what Paul knew. God works through human authority, the good ones and the bad ones. And to rebel against that is, a, is kind of the equivalent of rebelling against your Father in heaven. And the flip side is, is if you're a boss, if you're in a leadership position, you're God's agent for people that work for you. You're God's agent in their lives. If you're a public official, you're God's agent for the people who you're responsible for. And so we need to understand that God works through human authority, whether they believe in or, in, or recognize God or not. And your attitude toward human authorities is kind of a reflection of your attitude toward your Heavenly Father, because that's how God works. The third point I want to look at is in verse 5. We should be subject to the government not only because it's for our own good, but also because it's right. Also because it's right. This is Paul living under Nero saying, you should do this because it is right. How difficult would that be to write this? <clears throat> so therefore, it's necessary to submit now, Paul knows what we're thinking here, so he continues to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment. Now, I'm going to stop there, because that's what we do. You know, if you think that this is a, a dumb rule, I don't want to keep it, 
Uh, I'm going to get in trouble, so I'll keep it anyways. So the only reason many of us submit to the authorities around us is to stay out of trouble. I'm not saying for everybody, but that has happened in the past. I'm going to keep this rule because I don't, I don't agree with it. I'm going to keep it so that I don't get in trouble. Now, there's no necessarily any spiritual connection with this, necessarily. It's just that I want to stay out of trouble. You know, an example, my dad will kill me if, we ever, if he ever found out that I did this or this or this. Well, what if you knew that your dad would never find out? Oh, well, then I'm, I'm all over that, right? So what are you saying is, what are, what are you saying? Well, I'm saying that I'm not doing this because I agree, and I'm not doing this because I honor my father. I'm not doing this because I think my father's an agent of God. I'm doing this to stay out of trouble. And Paul takes us to the next level, and, and listen to what he says in verse 5. It's necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. So in other words, this is the right thing to do. So when we're doing taxes, when we're doing things in our business, and we know that so-and-so will never find out, the government's never going to find this out. I remember uh, a few years ago, I was doing my taxes back home, and uh, we would give uh, to the church and a couple other charities, but the, the donations were always nice. Like you, it, was, it was always good to get donations. You get a receipt back, and you'd claim it on your taxes, and you'd get some of that back. And so one year, um, the government saw that we had given a good amount, and so they chose to check to see if that was really the case. And I remember getting this letter and kind of freaking out a little bit because... I don't know, what else are they going to find? It, it was fine. We had all the receipts, but I'm like, what if, what if they find something else that, that I didn't even know I did or did not do? And um, it was in complete honest, honesty, but I'm like, what if, what, if, what if they find something that I had no idea that I even did? But it should be a matter of conscience. It doesn't mean that the government is necessarily godly, but they're an agent of God. And it means when you're taking a test at school or you have an opportunity to cheat or whatever, no one's going to find out. It's a matter of conscience. Because to cheat your teacher or the system is to cheat God. And it says, look, if you're going to be a God follower, this isn't a matter of keeping rules until you won't be caught. This is and should be a matter of conscience because ultimately you're not just accountable to your father, your boss, your teacher, or the government. You're accountable to God, and he's placed you under these authorities. And he gives an illustration in verse 6. He said, this is also why you pay taxes, for the, government, the authorities are God's servants. I found an interesting stat about the IRS, and I believe the IRS is American. It's their Internal Revenue Service. I wasn't sure what the S was. And so... Um, they, did, they did a study a couple years ago for the, the year 2015, and they found out that 26%, 26% of all Americans admit that they approve cheating on their income tax. So 26% would approve that, but it doesn't include the probably larger amount that would not approve it, but would cheat anyways. So the point is, it's not often how we disagree with our government, maybe how they spend our tax dollars or how we should be paying them or not or how we can protest them or not. But I want you to think about your life for a second. And maybe can you understand in your own life where maybe on one hand you're trying to feel this close connection to God and on the other hand you're dismissing all these authorities he's placed over you and you're thinking, oh, you know what, it's two separate worlds actually. These two things. They're not connected at all. But I think God's going like, you know what? Your relationship with me is not personal. It's not going to be intimate because you know what? You're not even under my authority. You're not even doing the things that I've placed over you. And you could say, well, I am. I'm, I'm here today. I'm, I'm, I'm in church. But God didn't place the church over us as an authority. He placed the government. And we need to, you agreed to certain things when you took, for example, that job. You agreed to certain things when you went to that school. 
There's authorities that he's placed over us. And so it brings me to this last point here. What about when the government goes against what God says to be true? So we've looked at some of these verses here. It doesn't specifically say what you do when the government is a bad government and asks you to go against your belief in Christ. And there's a couple examples I I pulled out from the Old Testament, and they're both found in Daniel. You are possibly aware of these, but in Daniel 6, uh, 6 to 10, I won't read the verses, but this is where Daniel has... Or, or King Darius has set up a decree, a new law, saying everyone needs to bow down to me for the next 30 days. And Daniel's friends uh, gave this idea to Darius so that they could, they could trap him. They knew this, this would get Daniel. And so Daniel, what Daniel does, as soon as it says in verse 10, which is so, it's incredible. Verse 10. It says, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published... It's now law. He went home and he hid in the corner and he prayed once. No. He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. I remember the other day when I was reading this, I was, I was struck by that. That's incredible. What would I do in that situation? I'd probably go find a closet. I hope he doesn't find me in here because I don't want to go against the the king's law. But Daniel goes and he's just so blatantly disobedient because he's like, you know what? Yes, you are the king, but my God is over you and I will not do things to, um, to hurt my relationship with with my one true savior. So he continues to do what he does. And he's like, you know what? Whatever happens, happens. I will accept whatever happens. So he was thrown into the lion's den. He was untouched. Um, King Darius was very, very upset that this even happened. And he pulled him out the next morning after he had not slept the night. And he says, Daniel, did your God save you? And he responds. And then he changes the law. It's cool to see how Darius changed the law after that. To, tr- to truly worship the one true God. And before that, we hear of, some, of Daniel's friends where it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you may have heard. And these guys, under cir- similar circumstances, but the, the, the law was declared so that um, all should bow down to the king's image. And these guys were like, yeah, we understand. We understand what the law is, but we're not going to do it because our conscience will not allow us to bow down to a king's image unless it, is, unless it is God. And in this case, it was not. And so they were just, they, they met their, um, the circumstances because of that. Whatever happens, happens. They were thrown into the fiery furnace, untouched, and um, an amazing, amazing testimony. But we need to remember when there are bad governments or corrupt governments couple things that we need to remember is one God is still in charge he is still in charge even though we may be under a bad government in a certain country wherever we live God is still in charge Romans 14 11 the next chapter says as surely as I live says the Lord every knee will bow before me every tongue will acknowledge God so God is still in charge And the second thing to remember when we have bad or corrupt governments who are maybe putting in laws that go against our faith, it says, remember, the so the rulers of this world will give an account for their actions. The rulers of this world will give an account for their actions. In Romans 14, 12, the next verse, it says, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. So, but not just the rulers, each of us will give an account. Well, if you're talking about authority, Trump is going to have to give an account. Magafuli is going to have to give an account. Mugabe is going to have to give an account. Trudeau is going to have to give an account. These guys are all going to have to give accounts of what they did or did not do as authority. 
It was interesting. I was reading a little bit in a commentary, and it kind of gave this idea, a really interesting idea. It says, if you had shown up at the time when Jesus was on trial, you know, with all governments, because if, if governments are doing certain things, you're like, where in the, why are they doing this? Why would they put this law in place? Why would they do this? I don't agree with this. I don't see what our government is doing. I don't get it. I think this country is going down in the drain. But it says, if you had shown up at the time when Jesus was on trial, what would you have thought? God, you got to do something. Come on, the Pharisees, they've hired people to lie about him. Now he's subject to this Roman governor who has no idea what he's doing. He's scared of the people. He's not going to make a good decision. Rome doesn't acknowledge you, God. Rome doesn't worship you, God. God, you got to do something. So when things look like they're out of control in a government state, remember that God is still in control. And so God responds by saying, you know what, I am doing something. If we could talk with him during that time, I am doing something. I'm saving the world through my, the sacrifice of my son, Jesus. If we were there at that time, we probably wouldn't have got it. The disciples weren't getting it. And these guys were closest to him. And if God can use Rome and the religious leaders in Jerusalem to accomplish his will, then what can he do in our country and in the authorities over you? <clears throat> so if you think of God and you, how he's working through human authority, you think of your own life, and you think that God is actually saying, you know what, I'm up to something in your own life. I'm up to something in that organization that you work for. I'm up to something through your parents. I'm up to something, um, whether you believe me or not, I'm up to something in your family. I'm at work, just like he's been at work through time and time again in history and in the future, he's at work. So how should we, as we close this morning, how should we respond today? If we look at 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4, we need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for those in authority over us, for your boss, for your government. We need to pray for our leaders. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4 says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in, God, in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So we need to pray for our leaders. We were, um, Friday night there was the prayer meeting at uh, the church office, and one of the first things we, we did was to pray for our government, to pray for the country of Tanzania. Um, it can go a long way. Uh, a second thing we need to do is to actually submit to the authorities because as, as, as a Christ follower, we should desire to do good because of our own conscience. And this is hard. This is really hard. To submit to the authorities, even though it doesn't make sense. Even though I'm going 34 in a 30 zone, I still get a ticket. It doesn't make sense. But I need to submit to those authorities that, are, that God has placed over us. And it's a really, really hard thing to do, but our text rests on the assumption that we are subject to God and want to please Him. Paul is promoting submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's showing us that, that submission plays out in our relationship to, the, to our government. So before we get right with the government, you've got to get right with God by re repenting of your sins, trusting in Jesus as your, holy, as your Lord and Savior. Because your relationship with Christ provides the basis for proper submission towards the government. And finally, in Romans 13, as a talking about the government and paying taxes, but if we go back to Romans 12, and in regards to submitting to authorities and doing these things that he's asking us to do in Romans 13, when we go back to Romans 12, he actually gives more commands that have to do with with others, being, being with others. It says in verse 14, chapter 12, verse 14, it says we are to bless anyone who persecutes us. We are to repay no one for evil, in verse 17. We are to live peacefully with all, 
verse 18. We are to never avenge ourselves, but leave vengeance to God, in verse 19. We are to feed our enemies and give them something to drink, in verse 20. There's all these commands that are coming before we even get to the authority, and then, God, and then Paul is talking about the authority that God has placed over us. But we have all these things here as well. Not repaying evil with evil. Blessing anyone who persecutes us. This is where it gets really hard. Because these commands, they tend to go against our, our nature. I don't want to repay someone with good if they've been evil to me. That's not my nature. And yet Paul is saying this. And then he goes into Romans 13. And he talks about the authority. He's talking about Nero being over top of him at, at the time. <clears throat> and I think as long as we understand Romans 13 and Romans 12 together um, and the authority that God has placed over us, we're able to, as I said before, that, that helps us with our relationship with Christ. Because if we are under, and as Andy Stanley had put it before, if we're under, uh, if we're not under the authorities that he has set up for us, then how can we be under God's authority as well? So, let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, we thank you for setting up authority, Lord. We thank you for the ones you placed in our lives. And Lord, help us with this passage. It's a very somewhat easy passage to understand, but hard to implement, Lord to submitting to authorities even though it may not make sense to um, for doing it because of because it's right because of our conscience help us with these Lord we need your help because without you we cannot do any of these things it is impossible to do these things without you so we pray for that in our lives we just pray for our the authorities that we have in our lives Lord we pray Lord that um, through us through others, Lord, that they can see um, your greater goal for good, Lord. We just pray that for our, our government. We pray for that for our president. We pray that for the ones who lead us in, in office and the ones who lead us in business, Lord. We just pray for your will in these men and women. And we just pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless them and uh, in their work that they do as well, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.